I search for God, but find no comfort. I begin to wonder, is my search too narrow? Philosopher friends tell me to widen my gaze. They invite me to a small workshop on alternative concepts of God, where in private they explore unusual ideas about God. A favorite is pantheism, the idea that God is the world and the world is God. Pantheism's claim is not shy. God is everything and everything is God. It seems that pantheism is becoming more popular, especially among some philosophers. What does pantheism offer? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Pantheism, God is the world seems so alien to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, where a transcendent God is radically distinct from all that God created. Pantheism is unfamiliar territory, and I am not confident in exploring it. But with so many roots trying to reach reality, familiarity and confidence may not be good signposts. The workshop is being held at the University of Birmingham in England. I meet a leading expert on pantheism, author of Pantheism in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Michael Levine. Michael, if I'm trying to weigh the different ways of looking at the world, theism and atheism are always the two tension parts of this barbell of, uh, of existence. I'd like to understand how you differentiate pantheism from theism. Pantheism is the classic alternative to theism. The two really crucial points at which it distinguishes itself is, first of all, theism is, of course, belief in a personal God, uh, a, a God that's con conscious in some sense. There is no personal God. There is no person. If there is no person, there is going to be no object of prayer as such, no object of worship as such. So, first of all, no personal God. The other one, I think, denies not just the personality of God, it denies the transcendence. For the theist, God is utterly transcendent, ontologically distinct, quite the opposite. What the essence of pantheism, if you will, uh, although it's, it, it's not enough to really describe it, pantheism insists on uh, eminence, divine eminence, and takes it to the uh, nth degree, so that God is, as it were, everywhere. The other way in which pantheism distinguishes itself from theism is the way in which, in which it addresses certain kinds of theistic problems, for example, the problem of evil. The problem of evil is a theistic problem theistically conceived, so the problem of evil is how could one account for the scope and the nature of the miseries in this world, given the existence of a God who's perfectly good, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Et all it's not that there may not be a problem of evil for a pantheist. Uh, there is indeed a problem of evil, and there is probably a variety of other kinds of problems, but they can't be theistically conceived, because at the heart of every theistic problem is going to be a personal a, a person. deed, etc. Sure, sure. So how would a person, how, how might a pantheist address the problem of evil? They might address it by suggesting that the unifying force isn't being attended to. It has to be enhanced in certain kinds of ways, that one has to bring one, one's mode of living into line with uh, the nature of things as such. So we help. must be a co-creator with the force to, right. make, to make it happen. That's is the force uh, um, morally positive or morally neutral? For most pantheists, undeniably, uh, it would, it would be a positive force. It would eschew something like Manichaeism, which suggests that there are these naturally opposing kinds of forces. Now, another, another problem uh, would be something like creation. Why would God create anything? Uh, people will give you an account of, well, God might have done it out of the goodness uh, to achieve maximum goodness, etc. The pantheist doesn't have to have a kind of solution that's rooted in the nature of, of a divine personality. Salvation, another way in which one is going to distinguish pantheism and theism. Salvation for theists has to do with personal immortality. Pantheists often talk about impersonal immortality. Robinson Jeffers, the Californian poet, says, to be part and particle of, of everything that exists, uh, what can possibly be better than that? And impersonal immortality is something that's achieved not post-mortem, if you will, but uh, it's something that 
insofar as one lives in accordance with one's pantheistic precepts, you achieve this impersonal immortality at every moment in which one lives. Pantheism is the classic alternative to theism, defined by denying what theism declaims. Pantheism denies that God is a personal minded being, and it denies that God is radically distinct from the world. Pantheism claims to avoid the problem of evil. Well, what about evil? If all is God and evil is part of all, then isn't evil part of God? That's fine for pantheists because pantheism's God is impersonal, devoid of mind, and morally neutral. Also, call me selfish or altruistically challenged, but impersonal immortality is not for me. I'd find no thrill in my post-mortem body providing the molecular feedstock for forests and oceans and people yet to be born. Although I'd be disappointed by what pantheism would offer for my long-term future, I cannot dismiss its claims of truth. So I go after pantheism's implications. I meet Peter Forrest, a mathematics-trained philosopher from Australia who offers dizzying ideas about God. Can Peter explain how a pantheistic world came to be? Often when people talk about pantheism, they have the idea of a purely inanimate universe and it being so wonderful that you say, wow, that's, that's God. That's not what I mean by pantheism. What I mean is that the universe, the sum total of things, the whole physical setup, the, po the actual and the possible, is God's body, the divine body. Does God have anything else other than the body? My own view is that in our case and in God's case, there's no extra part, the soul, that doesn't exist. But I hold that there is something deeply mysterious about consciousness and about agency. If you simply describe the universe in purely physical terms, that's wonderful, but I think it leaves out what the description of us in purely bodily terms leaves out, namely how it feels to God and God's capacity to, to do things. So, so let, let me understand how this pantheistic uh, uh, world uh, could happen. I mean, a useful image here is to think of possible worlds, ways universes might be, yeah. and the actual as just some of those possible ones. There is no actual universe as yet, so initially the body of God consists of all these possible worlds. As time passes, as choices are made by God or by other agents, then there is less that is merely possible and more that is actual. The only thing actual is that there are possibilities. Now, there are possibilities for physical universes, but is there an independent existence of something that's going to choose which one becomes actual? I'm inclined to think not, because I'm inclined to think that even in the human case, it's a mistake to think that there's a separate chooser that surveys this arena of uh, mental possibilities. All right, before there's anything existing, there are only possibilities, there are all these possible universes. There's no independent something that's gonna select them. So how does one get actualized? Because the agency, what it is to be a chooser, an agent, is I think made up by the choice. How do you, you have an infinite range of possibilities. How does any possibility become actual? The choice is made on the basis of what those possibilities are like. So, so the possibilities themselves have a built-in 
generative power to become actual? I wouldn't describe it as a, as a power to become actual. I would say that there is a basic mystery of agency here, which we don't understand uh, okay. in the human case. I mean, that's, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, wherever you want to introduce mysteries is fine. Yeah, well, I, I don't like that. mysteries, but I think we're forced to accept some. And I think in the human case, there's the mystery that things appear and there's the mystery that choice is made. And I don't think it actually helps understand to posit a something to which these appear or something that does the choice. I think the basic mystery is that the future possibilities or the present actualities appear and that a choice is made. You start off with these sort of luminous possibilities. I'm with you. Yes. Yeah. And Nothing that, independent of them. And that is God. So the possibilities are God. The, the body of God, yes. The, the luminous possibilities, that is God. And then one or more of them, based upon that thing, comes into existence. So God can then is actual in the, in the ones where there's the, for whatever reason, comes into existence. I do want to say, though, that the range of possibilities is itself actual, but it's actually the case that there are these possibilities. Yes, Therefore, it's yes, actually the case yes. of it's this primordial God. Okay. The choice is made, that's mysterious, but it's a choice for the good, and that's something I don't understand, but that makes for an agent. I, I don't find it helpful to think of an agent as something that has certain kind of powers and capacities before the choice. So God has that choice. So throughout the procedure, the sum total of what is actual and possible constitutes God. So in summary, what I'm speculating is this. At all times, God is the sum of actualities and possibilities. When a choice is made, the more is actual, the actual is defined more, and as a result, we have what we think of as the universes. And this is God's choice over God's own body. I think I get it. Peter is a pantheist in that the universe, all that exists, including things that are merely possible, is literally God's body. As time passes, Peter says, some possible things become actual things, as God has a choice over what constitutes God's body. But still, nothing of the body of God is outside of the universe, so there must be a basic mystery of agency. What is the ultimate to which pantheism can aspire? I ask a colleague and mentor, philosopher John Leslie, co-editor of The Mystery of Existence, Why Is There Anything at All? John, you were my intellectual mentor for decades. So I was surprised to learn that your fundamental belief is as a pantheist, because that always seemed odd to me. Well, let me say I have no firm beliefs. I have a belief maybe 55% in God and 45% that the universe just happens to be there, okay? And if you're going to believe in God, I think you have to be a pantheist because otherwise you're stuck with the view that there's God and he's there in all his glory and he creates a world which is infinitely inferior. The question is, why didn't he create another God? It seems to make much more sense to be a pantheist and say that the entire universe is God. If the universe is God, did God cre create it? Can, can you create something that's part of you? Well, on the pantheistic view, the universe is God, but you are saying something definitely more than just saying God is another name for the universe. You are saying you can get some understanding of why the universe is there if you say that it has the characteristic of being unified in some dramatic way and if it has the characteristic of being essentially mental and if you say it has the characteristic of being essentially good. And if you're saying that 
as I prefer to develop pantheism, the goodness of the universe is the reason why the universe is there. All these are ways in which you add more to the idea of God than just saying God is the universe. How could you say the universe is mental? I mean, it, it's, it's physical. Many you know, neuroscientists think that the mental is just a, an illusion for the output of the physical, physical brain. One way into this would be to look at those scientists who think of the universe as a computer simulation. They say it is possible to have enormously powerful computers, and one of the things which they'll be able to simulate is the patterns of entire universes, and we are a pattern in one of these simulations. We could be inside an electronic brain. You don't really say very much about the universe when you say it's made of physical stuff. Yeah. Modern physicists talk about the universe's pattern. If you say this pattern is carried by a cosmic mind, you're not saying anything which a physicist should be offended by. Uh, what, what do you gain by adding that entity instead of just saying, yes, it is a pattern, it's the physical pattern, the information, and that's what it is. You're adding another entity. You're saying that pattern is within a, a mind. Well, one thing you might gain is adding more value to the universe. If you think that most of the universe is made of physical stuff and has absolutely nothing to do with consciousness, then most of the universe might as well not be there as far as value is concerned, because it seems to me that only consciousness has value. Another thing you're adding is with the traditional concept of mind, before the neurophysiologist came along and said the mind is just the brain, <laughs> yeah. uh, the mind is unified. And some people would say a lot of the neuroscientists aren't taking on board the extent to which quantum physics talks about the universe as unified. You mentioned that pantheums, in addition uh, to, to giving a mentality to, to the universe, gives unity to the universe. You see a unity in the physics. What greater unity do you buy by adding this uh, pantheistic uh, god, quote unquote? What you're saying there is we have the unity of a rule of law, the same laws of physics running the entire universe. In addition to that is the idea that the individual parts of the universe couldn't exist in isolation any more than the weight of a stone could exist absolutely in that isolation or the color of the stone or the shape of the stone. These are all parts of one and the same stone and they couldn't exist apart from each other. And similarly, it's said by a, a lot even of quantum physicists, the individual parts of the universe couldn't exist in isolation from each other. They're all abstractions. Now, when you say that, you're saying the sorts of thing which pantheists have said. But do you, you gain anything with the pantheism? Because maybe the physicists are saying what's correct, but that's all there is. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't see the incremental value that you get uh, from doing so. I think one of the things you'd get is the belief that the universe is essentially good. When I'm trying to defend pantheism, uh, I would say that the unity of the universe and the fact that the universe is essentially mental are essential to the goodness of the universe. And the goodness of the universe is something which can help explain why it exists. That's my take on pantheism. There are pantheists of all different descriptions. You could have a pantheism which simply says there's gods everywhere. There's a god of the streams, there's a god of the trees and so on. <laughs> there's that sort of pantheism. Uh, I'm thinking of respectable pantheism, the sort of I defend. <laughs> John argues for pantheism by rejecting the traditional view that an all-powerful God would create a world infinitely inferior to God itself. The only alternative, John says, is that the entire universe is, in a way, God. The universe, he says, is unified and mental and could exist within a divine mind. John argues that the reason the universe exists is value the fundamental goodness of the universe. Value, he says, resonates well with 
respectable pantheism. Love as I do these hot, extravagant speculations of pantheistic philosophers, I need a dose of cool, crisp analysis. I'm pleased that philosopher John Schellenberg is attending the Alternative Concepts of God workshop. John is not a pantheist, and he is certainly not a theist. John, you argue that theism is false because of the hiddenness of God. Now, in pantheism, God is defined as everything. So then God is the most obvious, unhidden thing hmm. in pantheism. Does yes. that make pantheism right? I think that it's possible to provide uh, a credible notion of, of, of God in this, in this way, uh, this pantheistic idea of God. First of all, you have the very simple idea that, that we identify God with the world as we know it, and that's all, okay? So, so the world, perhaps as described by contemporary science, the natural world, all we do is we add the sticker God, okay? We say this, this thing, you know, that science is talking about, telling us all about, we will just call that God. I don't find that terribly plausible. Why should I call that sure, God? Sure. I mean, it doesn't seem to be ultimate uh, uh, in any value-related sense, and I think that one of the things that a religious idea requires is, is that sort of axiological ultimacy. Value, uh, something. Yeah, axiology, the theory of value. So, so that first idea tends to leave me cold, but it could be that instead we think of the possibility that there may be an awful lot more to reality than we do know already. One of the figures, historical figures associated with pantheism is Spinoza, the 17th century Dutch philosopher. And he, in one place, says that of the modes of God, we're acquainted with two, uh, mentality and materiality, okay? So, so mind and matter. But reality as a whole, God as a whole, includes just an infinite number of, of modes. So that idea starts to tantalize me a little more. So if we think that reality might infinitely transcend our uh, present understanding of it, or the, the extent to which we come to know it through science, for example, then when somebody says, I'm going to call that God, well, well, maybe, maybe that would be worthy of such a label. Well, theism would claim that this is a, a, an impoverished view of God because God is not a person and there's no relating to that oh, person and yes. no personal characteristics. Well, there might be some role for personhood, perhaps not personhood as we know it. It could be that personhood as we know it is sort of the thin edge of a, a wedge that expands infinitely. And there could be a way of understanding personhood uh, that is exemplified in God that exceeds our present comprehension. Could also be that personhood as we know it, consciousness uh, in one form or another has some place within the infinite dimensional uh, divine reality. I think it would be well advised to take the Spinoza route to say that the divine reality might infinitely exceed hmm. um, consciousness and what we know of personhood. John, it sounds like you're uh, morphing from mm. an atheistic uh, uh, critic into a, uh, a kind of a soft pantheist. No, I wouldn't say that. I th think that a certain form of pantheism is epistemically possible. By that I mean that it it's not obvious that it's false, I and mean, it's worth investigating further. And it's quite compatible with that view to say that traditional theism is just plain false. Uh, the idea of consciousness infinitized, the traditional idea of God, um, has irremediable problems uh, attached to it. So, although I remain open on pantheism, I am an atheist. Those two are compatible. Is pantheism reality? I'd be disappointed as well as shocked, if it were. But here's what I do get from pantheism. God, if there is a God, has a truly intimate relationship with the world. I also take seriously the desire to have only one kind of stuff, not the sharp dualistic distinction between physical and spiritual. But I cannot go with pantheism. Moreover, I root against it. If I go for explanations beyond science, I'd hope for personal afterlife, which pantheism cannot offer. I put pantheism to theistic philosopher Richard Swinburne. That wouldn't make God a very simple being, would it? That is to say, there would be a large number of parts of God. <laughs> 
and uh, one would wonder uh, how uh, these are related to each other and since things uh, behave in the universe in different parts of the universe in the same way one would suppose uh, the simplest explanation of that would be in terms of something outside them controlling how they behave in the same way. Some scientists are attracted to pantheism to make science sacred, to invest the world with wonder, to sense awe and light of the vast universe. While wonder and awe bring short-term joy, alone they provide no long-term solace. Turning to pantheism to replace worship in theism with reverence in science pays a price too high. So while pantheism, for me, is not truth, it may help get us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.